And so on the back of that, what we then thought about was our values. How do our values then meet up with that? And what I'm going to share with you very reasonably briefly, I was going to say very, but let's not say that. Um, what I'm going to share with you it then is going to be a five points where hopefully we will remember them. Uh, it's an acrostic where we'll begin to inculcate that and we'll unpack what that means for us as a church. Um, and it's not just what we're saying here this morning, here's five things. Um, one of the things that bothers me about church visions a little bit is there can be a lot of activity and bluster and excitement and nothing happens. Does that bother you? Four of us, that's okay. For the rest of you are okay with nothing happening. No, not at all. What we want to do is to be able to say behind this, and I'll explain some of this in a few moments, there is going to be a, a road map, if you want, a way to actually get us there. Because I don't believe in just getting people stirred up and excited for the sake of being excited. I want us to transform into something that God can use greater than he is now. I'm not saying God doesn't use us at the moment, but I think he has more for us. So the first, and you might want to write these down if you've got a pen or, or an iPad or an iPhone or some sort of tablet, paracetamol, write it on that. <laughs> S is for sacrifice. What do we mean by that? If we look at Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, we read these words, Therefore I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. What is the pattern of this world? The pattern of this world, and I'm going to go very quickly, but it's, it's basically selfishness. It's me first. It's what I can get out of it. So if you look at any problem in the world, uh, and these are going to be broad statements, but understand I'm covering a lot today. Um, if you look at the problems in the world, consumerism, materialism are all based on selfishness. If you look at sexual immorality and fornication, that is based on selfishness. There is nothing based on, on that kind of sin that is considerate of the other. It's all selfishness. If you look at um, marital breakdowns, and I'm aware that several folks here have had marital breakdowns, and I lived in a house where, and not my marriage, but where I grew up with, with lots of marital breakdowns, so I'm not condemning but people will come to me and say, well, it's a lack of communication is our problem. It isn't. It's selfishness, which leads to a lack of communication. The root cause of many things in this world is selfishness. Why can't we feed the world's population when we have enough food to feed the world's population? Selfishness. You know, put anything you want to it, and that's what it's about. Even the fall, Eve looked at it and thought it looked good. Why? Because she thought she was going to benefit. There's selfishness that's in our heart. The power, pattern of the world is selfishness. To live sacrificially is to actually turn around and say, I'm not going to be selfish. Uh, it's what we preachers used to call eye disease. I put me first. Living sacrificially is not an attempt to, to return to the sacrificial system of the Old Testament. We're not going to start slaughtering lambs on the, on the platform or anything like that because there is the complete work of Jesus Christ. However, we are all called to live sacrificially and place ourselves on the altar of the Lord and be at his disposal. That is an act of worship with our life. The problem with the living sacrifice is that it keeps crawling off the altar. And we all crawl now and again. We want to call the church to live sacrificially. So what does that look like? Well, in brief, and bearing in mind, I'll unpack some of this in the coming weeks. Well, I can give you a quick praise of that. It's Micah 6, verse 8. This is what it means to live sacrificially. He has showed you, O man, what is good. And he, what does he, the Lord require of you? To act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly before the Lord your God. In essence, then, to live sacrificially is to act justly. In other words, do the right thing, even when everyone around you is telling you it's the wrong thing in terms of ethics and morality. When our friends look at us and say, why do you act like that? It's just the right thing. I am a living sacrifice. What does it mean then to love mercy? That's to show mercy to those around us who don't deserve it. And that starts with me, because uh, I don't deserve mercy, but I've received God's mercy. But the mercy that we've received, we begin to show others. 
What does it mean to walk humbly before the Lord our God? It's to realize that although at times we might appear on the face of it to have moral high ground over those who are not saved, but we realize that actually our moral high ground is because of the high ground Jesus occupies on the, when he went to the cross. And that actually our morality is not our own. It actually is informed from him, isn't it? We don't make up the rules. Jesus did. So we walk humbly before him because of the complete work of Jesus on the cross. So the first thing we need to remember is S is for sacrifice. Are we all all right with that? The second thing is E is for extend. One of our values has to be reaching the lost in every and any way possible. 1 Peter 3 verse 15 tells us, But in your heart set apart Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you the reason for the hope you have, but do this with gentleness and respect. This verse reminds us that each of us in our world, if we're going to serve God in our world, have a responsibility to personally share our faith with others. Now, I know that it's been tr- attributed to fr- St. Francis of Assisi that preach the gospel and, if necessary, use words. I think that has been a cancerous phrase to the body of Christ. We all need words, for faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. So if we don't hear anything, how are we to know? If we just say we're not going to use words, we are no better than, than a charity or a monastery. If we want to be like St. Francis of Assisi, we need to get born again, sell up all our father's earthly wealth, because he had a lot of money, go and find a hill overlooking a small hamlet, build a monastery, and demonstrate Christianity on someone's doorstep. So if anyone wants to sell up everything and go and do that, feel free. But please don't say say to me after service, do you know, we don't need words to share the gospel. I got saved because somebody told me about Jesus. You got saved, the majority of you, because someone told you about Jesus. And your reaction might have been, I didn't know you were a Christian. Because what is the difference? There are lots of nice people in the world. We have a personal responsibility to share our faith. 1 Peter tells us that. And our world. But then there is a global perspective in Matthew 28, 19, 20. You would know these verses well. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you and surely I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. These words of Jesus remind us we have a global mission as well. We're to go into the whole world. Isn't that exciting? Because the whole world includes Hawaii. Isn't that exciting to know that God loves the whole world? And that we are to demonstrate that love. It's been said that the promise to be with the church by Jesus, and lo, I'm with you always. Patrick Johnson of Operation World fame says this, that those, uh, the injunction to go and the, and the promise that Jesus is with us are so closely bound that if we do not go, we cannot expect him to be with us. Isn't that interesting? Because we like the fact, oh, Jesus is with us. But unless we're actually doing something for him, I'm not sure we can actually ask him to be with us in special ways. My friends, we are, and we've mentioned this before, and I'll mention it again, we're going to form a new outreach team here that will um, be responsible for overseeing and energizing local mission and international mission. Because we're to extend. That word extend means to stretch. It means to push the boundaries outwards. And we're reminded this morning something just happened on our doorstep, a tragic incident. My friends, we need to extend. So you might say, oh, that's happened on our doorstep. But our doorstep is Essex. We have a responsibility for our world. E is for extend. Is anyone excited yet? You're all sitting there going, oh, it's all going to be such hard work. (laughs) Yes, it is. R is for relationships. The Christian life is all about relationships. Can I just say that sometimes men, we would struggle with this word relationship because most of us come from a a place where relationships haven't worked out for us. But when we talk about relationships, we're talking about partnerships. We're talking about um, something more meaningful than that. In Ecclesiastes 4 verse 12, though one may be overpowered, so that implies a battle, doesn't it? Two can defend themselves with implies a battle. You know who your friends are when you're in the thick of something, don't you? 
But a cord of three strands is not quickly broken. There is a power that comes from um, a synergy that we can develop in the church. Synergy in the um, Cambridge Dictionary is defined as the combined power of a group of people when they're working together, when they're, when working together, they're working together is greater than the total power achieved by each working separately. 